Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Espinosa. I'm joined here by Brenda Slaughter-Reynolds and Rafael Vaca. Three of us are members of the Grants Administration Division at this LA City Department of Cultural Affairs. Thank you for joining us at today's webinar that will go over our NEAR and co-op grant programs. This is our Neighborhood Engagement Artist Residency Grant Program and Creative Opportunities Optimizing Promise Grant Program. We are talking about our 2022-23 grant cycle, which is envisioning projects that will take place from July 1, 2022 into June 30, 2023. Um, a quick overview of how the day will go. Um, we'll, the webinar in, in total will be approximately 90 minutes long. Um, the first portion of that, uh, my colleague Brenda will walk us through an overview of the program, eligibility, project types, project expectations, timelines, so forth. And we'll switch gears midway, where we'll do a deep dive in the online application on the SurveyMonkey Apply platform. So, and as I mentioned earlier, although we can't hear you, we do invite your questions throughout the presentation. Please uh, send them to us using the little chat box towards the bottom right portion of your screen. Type in your questions and we'll monitor that throughout the presentation. For those who are on a phone, um, you can't access the chat feature. So do stand by for the towards the very end of the presentation. We'll have an opportunity to um, invite you to speak your questions if you have any that you'd like to offer us. All right, with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Brenda, who will walk us through the first portion of today's show presentation. Brenda. Thanks, Ben. Uh I'd like to begin the meeting today. This webinar will begin with the DCA land acknowledgement. The City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs recognizes and acknowledges the Yava team, the first people of this ancestral and unceded territory from the Tongva village of Yagna, now known as downtown Los Angeles. The greater Tongva region, which contains much of the current city of LA and contained hundreds of independent Tongva villages, was called Tongva Nayar or the first people of this land. We pay our deepest respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Please take a minute to consider the land and water we live upon and the many legacies of the once vibrant communities stripped of their freedoms and cultural traditions. Today, they call themselves the Gabrielino Tongva, the Fernandinho Tontavim, and the Venturino Chumash. We recognize that the Yava team are still here and we're committed to lifting up their stories, culture, and life ways and honoring their land, ocean, and sacred spaces. Thanks everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar on the NEAR grant and the co-op grant, formerly known as AIR and AIRSJ. You'll see here that the NEAR residencies are funded at $6,000 or $12,000. $6,000 would be five sessions and one culminating event. $12,000 would be 11 workshop sessions and one culminating event. Uh, we anticipate to be able to fund 22 teaching artists for the NEAR grant, ideally one for each of the 15 council districts. You'll see that the co-op residencies are funded at $15,000, and that's with $12,000 allocated for the artist payment and $3,000 allocated for the social justice organization administrative expenses. DCA hopes to provide up to 15 of these co-op grants for teaching artist residencies with social justice organizations. And we're gonna do that with an emphasis on projects in the federally funded recognized South LA Promise Zone. And for those of you unfamiliar with that, that is City Council Districts 8, 9, 10, and 15, south of the 10 Freeway and north of 228th Street. All co-op residencies will consist of 11 sessions with one culminating event. That being said, the overall number of near and co-op grants we will be able to offer next year will be contingent on DCA's budget for the upcoming fiscal year. The deadline to apply for both of these programs is November 5th, at midnight. I'd also like to let you know that for your NEAR grant, we are encouraging you to list the 11 workshop option in your application. With the understanding, you may need to scale back to five. Okay, let's give you a little more of an overview of this program. On the right, you can see some culminating event flyers for samples that we'd like to share with you. You'll see the um, HIV Writer by Artists in Residence, Don Tinley. And you can see the Hip Hop Dance Residency with Asia One. 
She did this with uh, the youth served by Chuco's Justice Center and Pico Union Housing. So as I said before, the NEAR grant program, formerly called Artist in Residence, co-op grant program, formerly Artist, I'm sorry, Artist in Residence, SJ. So for the NEAR co-op, for the NEAR grant program, these are going to be local and neighborhood focused. They're meant to be local initiatives in neighborhoods where the artists work and live to provide neighborhood cohesion and authentic collaboration. And the majority of those residencies are going to take place at non art nonprofit agencies. Although some of the projects in non arts for profit can also be eligible if this partner host venue is appropriate and accessible to the general community. It's very important for DCA accessibility. For the co-op grants, this is a special partnership and this is going to support freelance teaching artists, social activation artists, and social practice artists in providing community-based participatory projects for self-selected non-arts venues within the city of LA. Um, this Creative Opportunities program is going to be a collaboration of a nonprofit social justice organization and a creative teaching artist. Some of the goals of the program. DCA wants to support creative arts resources to neighborhood and host partner organizations for each council district. So we do this through the artist and residency program spread throughout the city. We want to support projects that consistently engage no less than 20 participants per workshop on some topic of thematic learning. It's, it's advisable that these participants attend each workshop and that this group will culminate the workshops by staging a final presentation or, or public presentation uh, viewed by no less than 40 individuals. So we want this open and accessible to the public to attend. Another goal is to sponsor the implementation of educational participatory residencies by the most qualified teaching artists in the city. We also strive to provide host or is offering little or no arts programming with this opportunity to test or develop this new service and to possibly integrate arts into their programming. So social justice organization. We have a very long definition of what a social justice organization is in regard to this grant. We have a, a, broad, a broad definition with a wide lens, but it is certainly not all inclusive. So please do read the guidelines to ensure that your organization qualifies to apply for the co-op residency. If you have any questions at all, email us or call us. We are always happy to guide you through the application. Let's go over some eligibility requirements for this grant. Just going to point out another uh, artist and resident culminating event flyer on your right there. And the artist in residence was Christina Wong. She did a theater residency with the Dream Resource Center at the UCLA Labor Center. So for eligibility, it's a must that all residents must reside or be headquartered in the city of Los Angeles, in the county of Los Angeles, excuse me. Uh, the services must take place within the city of Los Angeles, but you may reside or be headquartered in the county. That means Pasadena, Burbank, but the, the actual activities must take place within the 15 council districts of the city. And applicants for the near residency should be individual artists. They can be a duo or a team under the leadership of a single artist whose community-based practices have been largely self-developed and remain primarily self-directed. Applicants for a co-op residency may be a social justice organization or a nonprofit organization opening or continuing a fresh partnership with a social justice organization in any district of the city. And as I said before, priority is going to be given with special attention to South LA, Council Districts 8, 9, 10, and 15, south of the 10 freeway and north of 228th Street. So, for the co-op residency, the teacher may be an employee of a nonprofit arts organization and use the methodologies they've learned at their nonprofit to offer services outside of their hours to perform this independent residency. 
the applicants for a co-op residency grant must have an operating budget of at least $100,000 and no more than $10 million. And this will be demonstrated by the social justice organizations 990 they will submit with the application on behalf of the artists. All teaching artists should at least demonstrate two years or more of experience instructing participants in the proposed discipline within projects at non-arts venues, public schools, parks, libraries, or similar community centers. Okay, now we're gonna go to what the residency funds are actually used for. And I'll point out to you on your left, you'll see more culminating event uh, flyers. And on your right, another culminating event flyer. On your left, we have um, Stephen Rains. He did a poetry residency with seniors at the Los Angeles LBGTQ Center. And on the right, you have Christina Suarez, who did a dance residency with vets at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare. Um, the funds are used for these community projects held in publicly accessible facilities. That's not to say we don't want you to approach venues which may not be available to the general public. We would provide special permission to do a residency at, for instance, a, a domestic violence shelter, juvenile detention camp, and the like. Those merely are a phone call to us letting us know the parameters of the availability of the community to be present. Also funds can be used for these sustainable activities and they're gonna be projects emphasizing the creative process, community participation, creative thinking, skill building, and resulting again in one low cost or free public presentation. So as you can see from the examples we shared already, there's a wide variety of arts going on in a wide variety of venues throughout the city. And that's what we are hoping for. And that's what these residency funds will be used for. Here's some more examples of culminating events. To your left, we have um, Judy Leventhal, artist in residence, with her uh, mask making residency with New Directions for Youth. In the middle, we have Sierra Payton, who did a film residency with youth at the Girls Athletic Leadership School. And on the right, we have Deborah Disman, artist in residence, who did a bookmaking residency serving youth and families at the Panorama City Branch Library. So just a reminder that um, these grants are intended for the workshops done in non-arts venues culminating in a public performance or public presentation. There are some things that DCA does not fund. That is events closed to the general public. There are exceptions to that, as I had mentioned earlier, such as uh, better women's shelter and the like. DCA does not fund purchase of depreciable assets. If you need to buy a video camera uh, to archive your work, that would not be reimbursable. However, if you rented a video camera to archive your work, that would be reimbursable. DCA does not fund cash prizes, competitions, awards, hospitality, food costs, travel, or accommodations. These are all risk management issues for the city, and these can be utilized with any donated or other offered funding for your project. Particularly, please do not submit an application that is a competition. This is not a, a one winner program. This is a public program with everyone participating. DCA does not fund projects that are primarily religious in nature or intent or projects at public schools that do not include at least 14 hours of workshops and one after school or evening assembly to which the public is invited. And just to mention schools as a host venue allowed, however, it must be accessible to the public for the culminating performance and the workshops should not take place during the school day. Most important for this is your host venue organization. So this is gonna be a relationship and it's gonna last anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. A site should have shared goals with the project. They shouldn't already be providing the same classes or workshops or similar services. The host should commit to donating their time and space to this project. 
provide safe services in a site that's ADA compliant. As again, another priority, we, we want this open to the general public. And so if it's not accessible to participants or the public, that, that perhaps wouldn't be the best host to approach. And we also want the host to understand how to best coordinate a program that will be attended and recruited, uh, help with recruitment uh, and any members. Your host site may have a mailing list. It may have um, an understanding of, of your needs and be able to help you. Another thing a host site can help you with is insurance. DCA will require insurance for all of these projects, and that is typically a host site has been able to provide our artisan residents. As I said earlier, geographic distribution and the demographics therein are very important for the Department of Cultural Affairs. To that end, these applications are scored in a, in a variety of lenses. So our, our program really strives to serve all 15 council districts. And the co-op collaborations will have a special emphasis in city council districts 8, 9, 10, and 15, south of the 10 freeway, and north of 228th Street. We've also incentivized, mildly incentivized, council districts 5, 10, 11, and 15 which for DCA have been somewhat underserved. Your application is going to be ranked for funding and it's going to be based on a panel score and the council districts served. I encourage all of you to pick three council districts, your main host and your two backups. When scoring and panel takes place, someone who outranked you in Council District 5 may not have picked Council District 6 as their second, and therefore you would be moved to Council District 6 with your award. So please be mindful of the application and please also consider a second and third choice. All right. Ben is gonna go over the application in depth on the second half of this webinar. But I just wanted to give you a little preview of what the application components are. So there is a lot to be thought about in the project narrative. You would you, it would be advisable to have a good overview of your whole project start to finish prior to beginning this application. For the project narrative, the application is going to ask you many things. Demonstrate your ability to research, plan, and implement this residency. Summarize your qualifications. Describe the short and long-term community benefits. Describe the participants and audience. Are there collaborating artists? How will you collaborate with your host organization for outreach? How will you generate an atmosphere that encourages artistic expression? How will you evaluate your project? What is the timeline of your project? To that end, you're going to have a lot of attachments to upload. Then we'll go over those specifically. Those are going to include everything from work samples to resumes. And most importantly, your budget. All right, now we're in the grant cycle. So right now we're in the first rectangle, September and October workshop assistance. After this webinar, please do feel free to reach out to us by phone or email. Email is the fastest way to reach us these days to ask us any questions along the way you have for the application. The deadline, again, Friday, November 5th, after the deadline, uh, you will receive an email uh, congratulating you on your successful submission. It's also going to ask you to mail us a hard copy. The deadline for mailing us the hard copy is going to be Wednesday, November 10th. And then there's a bit of a wait while the city budget gets announced. And so we will then know how we can allocate these grant awards after the city budget is announced. And that's going to be in the May, June timeframe of 2022, pardon me. Then, should you be uh, funded, contracting will begin in the May, June timeframe. And your services period, as Ben stated at the beginning, will be from July 1st, 2022 to June 30, 2023. Here on our website, 
is where you may go to find information in detail about these programs with drop-down menus and available um, explanations for each process, uh, each, each element of the application, and additional information on each program. Questions? Please feel free to reach us. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to your application. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Ben. I'm not seeing any questions yet in the chat box, so um, we'll go ahead and proceed with the second half of our presentation. Um, oh, so we're getting some questions. Let's, let's pause for a moment here and see if we can address some of these. Brenda, we have a question from our prior AIR recipient at a non-art site. Uh, this person is looking to create new relationships as a teaching artist. Do the NEAR grants ever support a first-time partnership, or is a co-op a better fit for starting a new project? Uh, well, I would say that depends. Um, uh, is, the, is the new project with, with a host that you've worked with before? Uh, is the first-time partnership uh, going to be a good match? Is this a host or... Um, or a venue in your neighborhood. If it's if it's a local program, perhaps look at the near application. If you're looking to create a new partnership, social justice organization would be a fine choice. Um, I would need to know a little bit more about your specific discipline in order to guide better. So please feel free to reach out by email and I'll be happy to set up some time to talk about it with you. I'll add some general feedback. Generally speaking, um, as an eligibility requirement, it is not required to have a prior working relationship with your proposed uh, host site, although it is very much favorably viewed by the panelists. Um, um, working history with a partner is a great indicator of project success and likelihood of successful uh, project execution. So um, one of the things that we'll go over in a minute about what you'll be submitting as part of an application is, uh, is a host letter, a letter of support from your host site um, talking about what they're able to provide, talking about your working history, all of those contribute towards likelihood of project success, which is viewed favorably by the panel. Um, but it is not an eligibility requirement. If you have a new partnership in mind, um, you've had some early exploratory conversations with that prospective partner, um, and it looks promising logistics-wise in terms of um, participant rosters that the host organization provide for you, you have a good project plan, I don't see why not. Throw your hat in the ring. Um, we would certainly welcome that proposal. Yeah. We have an additional question about whether or not a hard copy is required. We aren't asking for that. Once you submit an application electronically, you'll be prompted uh, with a, you'll receive an automatically generated email with instructions on how to mail us just the text portions of your proposal. Um, generally speaking, that's approximately 12 pages or so. No need to send us images that, of your artistic samples of your letters of recommendation. It's about the, the narrative portion of your proposal that we'd like to receive a hard copy. Um, Double-sided well. saves paper. Yeah. Um, we have another additional question here. Um, matching funds. Uh, matching funds are not required not for this required. grant program. Um, it's all, we'll talk about as well, as one of the things we'll submit as part of an application as a project budget. There'll be an opportunity to highlight any uh, matching contributions um, cash resources or in-kind time or resources going towards your project provided by either you, collaborating partners, or your host organization. It is not a requirement, although I'll often viewed favorable by the panel. Yep. One last question here. I'll pass this one on to you, Brenda. Just to confirm, um, can folks work with an organization like a safe house, a women's shelter? Yes, you may. Um, as, as I said, you know, Earlier, there are some protected communities out there not accessible to the general population and public. Uh, for instance, our artists and residents at the VA Women's Center um, does not have um, access to do a public presentation. So yes, please be in touch with us and we can best guide you how to propose that service um, uh, within the guidelines. Yes, definitely. Right, we have another question here. Can an arts organization be considered a social justice organization for the purpose of this grant program? If, for example, the arts organization is committed to serving primarily students who attend Title I schools? Uh, well, there's a 
parenthetical there, even if that language is not in our literal mission statement. So unfortunately, the mission statement is quite important as to the direction of the organization. And if your organization is already an arts organization, um, please give us a call. Um, it, it may not fit our current social justice guidelines at the moment, but I don't want to say no until I hear more about your organization. So please email us. We'll set up a call to talk specifically about where your organization is, how old the children are, and, and more questions we may have. Generally speaking, I will say I understand the argument for an arts organization being a social justice focused organization. But we'll remember another requirement of this program is that projects take place at locations where the arts are not present. So if That's you are right. thinking yeah. about being an arts organization hosting an artist in residence project, it doesn't quite fit us, fit the project um, goals. Um, however, if you if your organization has a potential partnership with a social justice organization that doesn't have involved with the arts, um, perhaps there's a possibility the social justice organization can submit a co-op proposal with a specific teaching artist from the arts organization in mind as they craft that proposal. So that would be a way for arts organizations to be involved in these grant programs we're speaking about today. Yes. Yes. So, so give us a call because arts organizations are typically not host sites. Um, but we would love to talk to you more about your ideas and Ben's suggestion of, of co-op. Another question here around, if a proposal is site specific, how can it be located in different venues? That's a good question. Um, you want to take that one, Brenda? Sure. I mean, I think we're thinking the same thing, Ben. So there's a geographic distribution of artists and residents. If your uh, um, project is site specific within the same council district, that's something we can entertain but we really want to understand how you're going to get everybody to show up each time at these different locations. So be very specific about that in your proposal. And if you're, if you're thinking that your project's going to go all over the city, this perhaps is not the right uh, grant program for that. Uh, yeah. We are council district specific artists in residence. It's a, it's a slight balance. It's a, it's a balance of, you know, finding authentic, uh, sincere partnerships where you as a teaching artist have relationship working relationships um, with uh, you know meet, uh, worthy nonprofit organizations around the city but we also want you to have backup partnerships in mind just in case um, you are a meritoriously scoring applicant but someone has already claimed that that's that particular spot on the map so um, one way we see this play out in the past is my teaching artists, I have this really great relationship with an organization based in Panorama City. I'm going to submit my proposal framed around working with that organization, working with that population in Panorama City. They're going to be my first choice. But in my back pocket, I also have a working relationship with another organization nearby where I live in, in downtown LA. And I want to work with the, with the mission based there. I might reach out to them as well. And they can also provide for me a host letter and letter of support. And they can serve as a backup and they're in a different council district. So that's what we mean about multiple venues. It's to, it's really more about having backup plans and partnerships in place just to maximize your potential for being selected for a award. And we'll talk about how you can present that in your application. And I'll switch to that now. Keep those questions coming. Our team will continue to monitor the questions as we uh, go through the next phase. So give me a second here. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so I, I'm a, the first landing spot is the full program guidelines. I think you've all seen this page. It's how you're able to uh, uh, register for today's webinar. Um, and I like to start here because I like to go to the part where we talk about the panel review process. Uh, as savvy grant writers, you know you go into the application process with an understanding of what exactly you'll be rated around um, by our peer panel. And to answer that question, is there are four key categories here that we want you to think about as you prepare your application material. Admin capability. This is uh, admin capability, ideas and innovation, impact relevance, quality of your community partnerships, 
all equally rated. Uh, they're all 25% of your overall evaluation. Admin capability speaks to your business savvy, um, the, the way you, the, it's the fit and finish of your proposal, the soundness of your budget proposal. Does it look feasible? Does it look reasonable? Um, is it likely to take place? Um, and it's your presentation, overall presentation of the proposal. Ideas are innovation. Are you coming to us with a really innovative uh, idea? Or are you coming to us with a tried and true idea and model that you've used multiple times that you know is to be successful? We're looking for the appropriateness of your strategy and the, the quality of the, your model for success. Impact and relevance talks about what kind of ultimate uh, the end outcomes, the impact you'll have on the community you wish to serve. Is there plans for uh, strategies for evaluating how well you're doing? Is there some sort of a pre-evaluation? Uh, is there some kind of uh, evaluation during the course of your project? And is there a post-evaluation just to understand how well your program has impacted your community? All of that uh, feeds into uh, how your, your proposal is rated on impact and relevance. And finally, quality and, and, and community partnerships. We're looking for how the, the extent to which you're involving uh, key community and project stakeholders. How strong is your partnership with the proposed host organization that you are coming to us with? Is there a working history of success? Is there a prior, in, uh, prior um, working history that you can highlight to showcase how well you work together and the, the extent of that collaboration with that organization? Any other stakeholders involved? Are there other um, community groups involved that you'll involve in the, in the outreach and project engagement? Are there um, other stakeholders, collaborating artists, looking for the, the systems of partnerships that you are that is potential has potential to be uh, uh, rolled out if approved for funding? So those are the four criteria we should all keep in mind as we're crafting a, an application proposal. And so um, Brenda gave us an overview of the various materials. So let's talk. Let's take a peek at what that will look like when we actually go and submit. You will have already read all of these gory details about what to submit to us for an <laughs> application. So let's go ahead and click on the next uh, link, which is the SurveyMonkey Apply platform, where the applications are submitted. If this is the first time you've uh, you've you've uh, arrived at this link, you won't see this page. Rather, you would see a, an invitation to. Uh, read about our grant offerings. We have two programs available right now. We're talking about this one, the Near and Co-op program. And if you haven't already created a SurveyMonkey Apply account, you can click on this green register button where you'll be prompted to enter some basic information about yourself and then type in a username and password, and then you'll be ready to go. Um, once you have that at hand, click on Login, type in your info, and the first thing you'll see um, will be an All Applications page if you've started uh, already. If you haven't, this will be blank. And to start an application, I'm going to click on the Programs uh, button up here on top. Click on Near and Co-op for more. And this will be a green button saying Start Application. Since I've already started one, I have a gray button here where we can do it. And let's go there now. So this is, think of this as the task list, um, the, your checklist of to-dos um, of items that comprise a complete application. Um, you'll know, you'll be able to track your process by these handy little icons. Anything in this half moon green looking thing, that indicates that you've started that stage but haven't quite completed it. Anything with a green check mark is something that you've completed, checked off, marked as complete. And anything with a grayed circle like this uh, indicates an item that hasn't been started yet. Uh, the, the, most, the, the, the biggest portion of your proposal is this very first item. It's the application form. So let's click into it and see what that's all about. All right. So uh, the application form consists of three pages. Let me navigate to the first page here. You can navigate through between pages by clicking on these previous and next buttons on the bottom of the screen. So this is the very first page of the application form. Page one, um, it would be referred to as the cover page. Basic information about yourself or organization. So uh, key, the very first question is, what type of proposal are you submitting? Are you submitting a near proposal, in which case you are a freelance teaching artist proposing a residency project with a non-arts venue somewhere in the city of LA? Or are you a co-op applicant? Two types of co-op applicants. Um, you are a representative from a social justice organization, and you have this fabulous teaching artist in mind, and I'm submitting a proposal crafted around residency with that teaching artist. Or am I of 
am I from a nonprofit arts organization? Um, and I'm seeking to expand the responsibilities of one of my currently employed teaching artists to be housed at a social justice organization across the city. So we had that question earlier uh, around how an arts organization can apply. This is yet another way that can happen. The one we, re we recommend you go about going uh, in submitting an application is asking your social justice app organization to submit an application on your behalf. Alternately, if that's not feasible, you as an arts organization can submit a proposal and with a specific teaching artist in mind who you plan to assign to that social justice organization. I think most folks in today's meeting are individual freelance artists, so I think we're gonna, we'll model this sample around that. Um, if, just so folks know that the major difference is if you are a co-op applicant, rather than asking for individual information, we're asking for an organization's information, like your legal IRS name, your organization's populating, organization's uh, operating budget, and so forth. But as a freelance a teaching artist, those bits of details do not apply. So let's go through this real quickly here. So as I'm a near freelance artist, I'm asking for my legal name. If I have a professional name, I'll enter that here. Um, mailing address, um, type that in. And uh, if your residential address is different from your mailing address, you have an opportunity to type that in here. What's important here is that you're entering an address that's somewhere within Los Angeles County, okay? That's an eligibility requirement. Next, we're asking for the council district in which you reside. Um, if you live within the city of Los Angeles, you're gonna be located in one of 15 council districts. If you are somewhere else but in LA County, um, you won't have a council district to report here. You can just simply check in the elsewhere in LA County box and type in where you live. Be Santa Monica, Culver City, Altadena, and so forth. If you're within the city of LA, but you don't know where your council district is, there's a link here to a neighborhood info tool. Open that up and, oops, that's not loading. It's loading. Um, you type in your address. Let's say 201 North Figueroa, which is where DCA is located. Click find, and you'll be in, presented with a, a range of information about your address. What we're talk, looking for here is city council. And you can see that DCA happens to be based in Council District 14. So that would be the box I would select here. All right, phone number, email address, uh, web address to your professional website, okay, if that's applicable. We also ask for a BAVN ID number. This is a business assistance virtual network ID number. Uh, one of the various systems the city of L uses to monitor uh, contractors and vendors. If you're a returning grantee, you probably have this already. Um, if you have it handy, please share it. If you don't have one yet, no problem, just keep it blank for now. It will be a condition of contracting, not necessarily a requirement for application. All right, all that filled up, click on the green next button. We'll get to page two, which is in um, a page sorry. where you... Yes, sorry, Dan. Uh, we have a, a, a quick question that applies to council districts. The question is, is it preferred that you live in the council district where the workshops and events will take place? Not a not right preference per se. Um, if that's part of your narrative and story about why you have that bond with the partner and social agency, I think it's something you should certainly illuminate and surface in your narrative. Um, one of the things that partner our panelists look for are connections, teaching artists connections. This is the quality of partnerships, right? Um, and uh, it, it goes into your ideas and innovation. Is this, is this a strategic partnership? If, it's, if it happens to be an organization based around where you work or live, that's a, that's a, a really reasonable reason why you really want to partner with that. Um, we are calling these near grants because uh, we are emphasizing that the hyper-local uh, neighborhood-focused nature of these partnerships and uh, teaching artists who partner with organizations where they live and work seems like a very logical type of um, connection. So it's not necessarily preferred. It can turn out to be a very good reason for why you're proposing a partnership, but it's certainly not required. Thanks, Ben. Second page of the application allows you to provide some key details about your host partnering organization. So first off, start off by giving your project a uh, cool title. Uh, this one I'm just kind of bland, but it's a creative writing residency I'm proposing. Um, you'll have something perhaps more specific, like uh, creative writing in, in South LA, or uh, you know, uh, hip hop dance workshops for the community in 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 downtown LA. That kind of thing. Give that a name. We're looking for a project start and end date. This should reflect the when your workshop series will begin and when that culminating event will finally wrap up. 
Um, you have a 12 month window to consider here for eligibility. Um, we are looking for projects taking place between July 1, 2022, going to June 30, 2023. Um, in most cases, um, near projects, co-op projects, we expect to be no more than six, seven, eight weeks long. Uh, allows you that time to do your series of workshops plus a culminating event. So here's a case where I'm anticipating a creative writing residency taking place in the late fall of 2022, uh, October 1, going into December 15. All right, so this is where we ask information about your, your venue so and, and partnering organization. Um, so your first choice, so this is where we're going to, we, we hope to put you in if approved for funding. Um, I, let's, let's say I live in downtown LA. I work very closely with a, a terrific organization near Skid Row. Um, they're based in Council District 14, the market there is 14. But at the same time, I also work somewhere in the, in the West Valley. I have this, I, I, I work at this wonderful, uh, in neighborhood where there's a great organization based in Canoga Park. They're in Council District 3. I'm going to mark that as well. I don't have a third choice here, although uh, just because I feel like these are my two strongest potential partnerships. Um, if you have a third choice, you are certainly welcome to apply and click that box here for a third option. Something to consider, though, is one of the things we're submitting in your application are host letters. And so I'm selecting these two because I know that I can easily get a, a letter or email of support from the venues I have in mind in downtown LA and the Park. Okay. Um, and this is the name of my first choice, ABC Youth and Family Services. Type that in. Um, and here's another question that asks around um, what kind of, to the extent your conversations have been going on with your prospective partner. Um, one of the things that we require of all DCA grantees is that you be insured uh, during the period where you're engaging with the public. And so one of the strategic uh, elements, uh, uh, strategic partnerships uh, among our near residencies is that oftentimes the host venue is able to include the selected teaching artist and ha as part of the organization's uh, general liability policy. They'll add you as an additional insured for the duration of your workshop there serving their clients. And so that's a great topic to bring up in your ex early exploratory conversations as you talk about the extent of your partnership. Um, in many cases, they, they they might say, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll if approved for funding, we'll include you in our, in our um, general liability policy. Um, if they're not willing to do that, that's okay. But do know if awarded a grant, we will be asking you to show us proof of at least a million dollar liability policy as a condition of grant award. So yes or no, just um, that we add that question because we want to remind folks it's a great thing to bring up in early conversations with prospective host partnerships. Um, I'm typing in the address of my my proposed venue in Council District 14, type that there. I repeat the approximate date of my culminating event where I invite the general public to come and see the wonderful work my workshop participants have engaged in for the past several weeks. And so these last three questions ask for some basic anticipated project metrics. Um, tell us about the number of artists that will be served by your project. This number will at least be one because it'll be you. We want you to make sure that you're going to be part of this project and that you'll be paying yourself for your time in it. Um, talk about any collaborating artists. So if you have in mind, for example, two guest artists to come in throughout the course of your residency, include that. Um, so that's three artists in my example. Participants are your, the people that you'll be enrolling in your workshop series. Uh, remind, remember that we have a minimum expectation of all of our granted projects in this category to have at least around 20 consistently attending every week. So um, this is an important part to highlight in your narrative and your, and your host letter um, submission is that you have some sort of strategy for in, ensuring your project has maximum enrollment. Um, knowing that we are expecting at least 20 consistently attending every week, we, in, we encourage all of our, our near grantees to plan on working with their host organization to enroll well of more than 20, um, 30, maybe even 40, with the understanding there's always some attrition in terms of registered and who actually shows up. And of course that number and could be very difficult to attain depending on the, the nature of the, the community you're, you're, you're seeking to serve. Um, there could be some very fragile communities where um, consistent attendance is very, very challenging. So we will be interested in understanding what your strategies are going to be to ensure that you are aware of this minimum 20 in attendance every week and your plans for ensuring success. 
And then the last item is the number of audience members, viewers, which are culminating events. Um, these are public monies, of course, and you want to make sure that these grants result in public presentations. So it's important that your project is planning for a culminating showcase, concert, exhibition, demonstration, or other public presentation where you're reaching an audience of 50 or more. Not just the parents and friends and families of the, the, the workshop participants, but you want to make sure you're marketing your event for your, for your neighborhood and community. And in this case, I'm anticipating an audience around 100 people. Yes, Brenda. Question around the public presentation. Are virtual workshops allowed, or does it all have to be in person? So That's a great question. And, and, uh, if you allow me, I'll actually extrapolate that question to uh, uh, our virtual workshops um, and uh, workshop sessions allowed. Um, and the answer is yes, they're allowed. Um, we want you to focus, however, on a very uh, local fo uh, a local organization and and their and their clients. You know, we, we don't want you advertising a program for workshops for the city of, uh, at large. We want you to focus on workshops. Uh, for the client served by your host organization and the community of that, where that uh, location is based. Um, and virtual workshops and presentations are allowable in the, in the world that we're in here. Um, that being said, we are asking you to forecast activities several months into the future. Um, the, the activities can start no sooner than July 1, 2022, going all the way into 2023, the following year. So. We encourage you to envision a world where we can all gather safely in person um, in the flesh. Um, and uh, we hope that you would structure your proposal based on that ideal. Um, but given the circumstances, we are all subject to a, a dynamic environment where safety protocols can change on a daily basis. So if you have experience doing virtual workshops and or culminating shows too, it doesn't hurt to include uh, that in your proposal in both your narrative and or artistic samples. Yes, if I could just add one more point to that, it might be a good idea to look at a host organization that has enough outdoor space to ensure 20 attendees for your workshops in addition to the indoor space. I'd also like to let you know if you are working with a protected community and public presentation culminating event is not possible, we have had grantees uh, submit a, uh, a copy of the event that took place without an audience, of course, um, just to uh, wrap up the grant with the final report and show the event that did take place to DCA staff only. All right, so the third and final page of the application form are all your narrative responses. So let's, uh, let's go over those questions real quickly here. The first one is asking for your project narrative. These are the, the I like to call the tech specs of your proposed project, where you will use very dry, specific, almost legalese to outline what your project's about. Tell us the who, what, when, where, and how of your residency. This is going to be a 12-week residency at such and such organization between October 1 through, through December 31st, um, workshop participants will meet uh, every week on every Saturday afternoon. It's going to focus on creative writing. Uh, weeks one, two, and three will focus on yada, yada, yada. Um, weeks three and four will involve guest artists. Um, weeks uh, weeks six, six and through 11, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to culminate in a, in a literary showcase of readings of, of an anthology of works created by uh, participants that will be presented live readings and will be recorded and then presented, all those level of details. And give us um, an understanding of who's involved, so not your role, guest artists, how many participants, how, they're, how they'll be recruited and registered, um, where the presentation will take place, and how you will ensure maximum enrollment. And tell us about the major uh, topics and learning arc that will take place also very important that you leave the panelists with an understanding of what exactly your workshop participants will leave with after engaging with you for 11 weeks. So um, put, take off the marketing hat, less about splashy adjectives and fancy marketing language, really dry details around the tech specs of your project. I'll note that there are 300 word max limits here for most of these narrative responses. The strongest proposals maximize the use of all of it. So um, one of the reasons we ask you to prepare all your responses in advance 
save it on a Word document file, is that you can take advantage of things like uh, the spell check, the word count, grammar check, um, and that's great for monitoring how long your responses are. But it's also great to have a record for yourself, so you can have that on hand um, for future applications also. Second question is asking about the teaching artist's key qualifications for the project. So please, this is your opportunity to really brag and boast about how you are so well qualified and suited to carry out the specific project. Highlight your uh, highlight your connection to the community. Highlight your education background, your, your, your many histories of teaching practice. Um, talk about any specific qualifications and certifications that make you particularly well suited to serve this uh, to serve this, uh, the clients of this of this uh, this organization, especially when it comes to um, residencies that emphasize services to fragile populations um, or differently abled persons, talk about your your history and other non arts focused training that makes you best suited to carry that out. Next question talks about long and short term community benefits that will result from your residency. To draw a picture of what the what their community can expect to get out of this residency. We want the story of I start your project as a participant at a point A. What will I look at point B when I'm done after 11 weeks? What will I have learned as a participant, and what uh, benefit will this have for the host organization in general and your community? Talk about the impact of your project here. Participants and audience to be served. This is just giving us a very clear idea of the special circumstances, uh, characteristics, needs, and any other uh, details about the specific population that your organization serves and that you plan to serve also. A great opportunity to call out uh, gender, family group, age groups, economic class, ethnicity, other socioeconomical characteristics that um, showcases how this population um, can really benefit from your proposed project. Collaborating artists, again, uh, this is not required, but um, many of our successful projects do involve other creative workers in the, in the execution of their successful projects. This, this is where you can talk about any guest artists who will come in and participate, any other technical um, staff or uh, partners that you want to bring in uh, uh, to help you carry out your project. Describe, uh, describe who these people are and their qualifications as well. OK, this next question is critical. It's asking about the extent uh, and your plan for collaborating with your host organization for outreach, solicitation, and multi-week engagement. Um, this, this is important. We, we, you want to convince the panel that if approved for funding, you and your partner organization should be ready to go to find and fill those seats and make sure that there's a consistent attendance of at least 20 or more people every week. So give us, uh, outline your outreach plan. Are there phone calls? Are there flyers? Are there multilingual um, outreach um, strategies? Are there follow-up phone calls for people who don't show up uh, after one or two uh, sessions? How are you ensuring that you are gonna meet this program's minimum project engagement um, expectations? Outline that plan for us. Yes, you could also mention how the host organization is going to help. Absolutely. Um, in all cases, I think without exception, the most successful projects that we see has strong involvement from the host organization, in ensuring that people know about your workshop, that they have an easy access to it, they register for it, and they show up. So all of those follow-up phone calls, uh, marketing and promotion, your host organization is going to be critical in ensuring that's successful. Next question, ask about how you will generate an atmosphere that encourages artistic expression and ensures active participation. Um, just, just draw a picture here for us around the, uh, what, the what the learning environment will be. Are you gonna be able to create a, self, a safe and healthy um, environment that's conducive to learning and creative expression? Tell us how, your plans for ensuring that those things um, will be. Um, so um, is this a, is, tell us, and as well in this, in this question, tell us about your culminating event and how it ties everything together. We're looking for a, a logical uh, end product that, that really highlights and honors your workshop participants and engages the rest of the community in the work that you've, you will have just completed. Next question talks about the project evaluation. Um, this, really, this will be the, your, really, your biggest chance to maximize that 25% uh, 
percent on project impact and evaluation uh, criterion. Tell us about your um, your evaluation plan. Is there a pre pre workshop survey? Is there means for a monitoring project execution during the project to ensure it's successful and to allow for any course corrections midway through? Um, is there some sort of post workshop survey questionnaire that you'll that you'll plan to send out uh, to assess what kind of growth your participants experience and to ensure your project was successful? Tell us your plans for this. And then the last question here is your project timeline. Um, we want to understand the, the timing of uh, your, your entire project. When is your um, planning meetings going to take place with your host organization? When is outreach going to take place? Uh, when will workshop number one start? Um, and when will the subsequent uh, sessions take place? When will the culminating event take place? Um, any other elements there? Walk us through here. This goes hand in hand with your the tech specs question. Um, leave your leave our panelists with a clear understanding of the overall arc of your project. And finally, we have a certification line here. Ask you to sign off that you are providing us um, accurate um, information at the time of your submission. After you sign that, you can mark this as complete, and you'll get a very satisfying green check mark on your task list when you go back to look at your application. And there it is. All right, any questions on the narrative and application form before we move over to the attachments? Uh, we have a question. Uh, if you have two different classes you could teach, you teach, could you submit two separate applications to see which DCA prefers? That's a good question. Um, and the answer is it's likely to be limited to one. So the, the restriction is this. Every eligible individual is allowed to apply and submit one proposal for our New York grant program. Um, so, with that in mind, if you have two ideas, um, I would recommend you focus the proposal on the single uh, residency, uh, unless you know both classes can be merged to deliver an eleven-week experience where you would include both elements. Um, the most the most focused proposals are the ones that really shine. So, I would recommend picking one. If, it's, if, if one fulfills the 11 week culminating event um, project uh, structure, um, if one workshop is only uh, five weeks long, perhaps there's an opportunity here for you to merge both. But the answer is we need only one application. We allow you only one application. So you decide to how you want to frame that one proposal. If it's one class or is it multiple classes? But I, I think then, would it be possible for a social justice organization to also propose the same artist? That's a good question. That's a good question. I don't have the answer to that, Brenda. Okay. So uh, if you'd like to give us a call and let us know about those two different classes, we could perhaps give you some more uh, mm. instruction on application and uh, I'd just like to, to pipe in that uh, in, in a 12-week workshop cycle, you're not creating a professional artist or a professional dancer. This is about engagement, expression, and exposure. So I just wanted to point that out. If you're thinking you're at the top of your teaching artist field, please just understand that these are giving arts experiences to people who would otherwise not have any. So that being said, we have one more question. Just confirming that we need to have confirmations from each host location listed in our application. It's a good question. Um, confirmation sounds like a heavy word. Um, we, want, we want an understanding that you have had conversations at least, at the very least conversations with each of your host organizations and some, some entry level sketching of what a potential partnership can look like. And we need that because one of the things that you'll be submitting, which we're about to talk about now, attachment, it's a perfect segue in this attachment A, um, our um, attachment uh, is when you, when, you sh when you share with us a letter from that host organization um, talking about what, the, what they're willing to put toward a uh, prospective partnership if funded. Um, they don't need to sign on the dotted line guaranteeing you everything that they're saying in their host letter. 
Um, but we want to understand that they, you've had at least some, some introductory conversations about prospective partnership and that if, if approved for funding, there's likelihood of, of that following through. Okay. And, and I misspoke. Uh, that's host letters come in attachment B. Attachment A is more of a summary of your uh, project location history and proposed um, locations. It kind of fits in. So attachment A is this. And this is kind of new for those who are returning grantees. Um, in the past, we've asked for host venue forms and host, and host letters only. Um, one of the things that come up in panel is inconsistent understanding across all applications. Oh, how long has this, org has this artist worked with this uh, particular organization? Oh, did, have they worked in the past before? Some applicants weren't consistent in providing that information. So we've, uh, we've, we've created this very simple attachment. We want you to create a, a, a one-page document on your own and just show us and list for us, here's an example of your first choice location. As you remember, this was ABC Youth Family Service. Give us your address, their address, their con your contact person there, and importantly, the number of years you've worked with that organization. So here's a case where I, I've worked with this organization for three years. That's very valuable information, and that, we, and that way you can make that very clear with this attachment. Here's my second choice, XYZ Community Health Center. I've worked uh, with them five years, so even longer in Council District 3. Very simple list. You can prepare this on your own. This is way we're going to cross-check this list of project locations with those bubbles you checked off in that first page of the app, second page of the application. Um, we want to understand your working history with those council districts. Once you've uploaded this document, there'll be a green button here to mark as complete, and then you'll get that very satisfying green check mark. Um, so attachment B is what I was referencing when you asked that question, when we received that question around a uh, confirmation from your host locations. So the answer is yes, there's some sort of soft confirmation of, uh, of possible partnership because they're giving to you an email, uh, a, a letter on their letterhead, outlining a couple of key things. And here they are. We want to see a letter that shows us their name and mission, uh, their current client demographics, that showcases and articulates their readiness to partner with you if you are approved for funding. Um, we want to have a sense of the what's available currently at that organization in terms of arts programming, if any at all. Um, how your proposed project is going to differ from that and add value. Um, we want to understand uh, the project impact, of course. Uh, a match of donated materials, space, underwritten insurance, any other in-kind support and resources that they're willing to commit towards a project. Um, Hallmarks of successful projects we've had in the past, there's an abundance of in-kind contributions at the very least. If it's staff time, maybe they've assigned a key person in their programming staff to work primarily with you to make sure that your registration is uh, at maximum capacity. They're going to help you with marketing to their clients. Um, they're going to provide you the space that's safe and accessible uh, during the times you need it to ensure a successful project. We want an understanding of what they're willing to um, contribute towards this project if approved for funding. The one item here that I'll call out would be unique for our co-op applicants is this is an opportunity for you to, uh, as, not, as a nonprofit arts or not social justice organization, include a letter of your 501c3 nonprofit status from the IRS at the end of this document. So you'll collect these letters for your first choice, second choice, and or third choice. You'll, you'll join it into a single PDF document and upload it here as an attachment. Any questions around the host letters? We're looking for at least two, two pages, no more, no more than two pages for each host letter. So you can keep them brief. Um, one additional note I'll make actually, in some instances, especially for our co-op applicants, we may find the case where you're a social justice organization, but you don't necessarily have space for workshops because you're out in the field serving your clients in your neighborhood. I mean, so what we found in the past is oftentimes a third location is needed for where the workshop will take place. Merely a venue for workshop facilitation and for possibly for culminating event. That's okay. Um, in that instance, if that's required as part of your project, a letter of a host letter from that venue uh, where the workshop will take place will also be appreciated. All right, let's move on to artistic samples, the next item on our task list, a very important section of your proposal. Um, this is an opportunity for the panelists who've been reading lots and lots and lots of texts on, on the page or on their screens to change modes a bit and see some fabulous video 
uh, or visual imagery of you and your work in action. So when it comes to artistic work samples, here's what we recommend. Um, we want to understand your, your, your uh, expertise and your strengths as a teaching artist, and not so much about your own individual work. So successful artistic samples we've seen in the past for this program are videos uh, of actual workshops taking place. So we can see how you facilitate a discussion, how you uh, navigate, how you uh, respond to questions from participants, and how you uh, otherwise lead uh, a workshop around arts and arts learning and skill building. And of course, a video or images from the culminating public presentation. Panelists like the experience of as if they were there to experience the showcase in person. They like being able to see what's on, what's uh, what's being presented, of course, but also an understanding of the audience in attendance. Is it well attended? Is it is it maximum capacity? Are are folks having a good good time? That kind of thing. So that's what you want to showcase in your artistic samples: a blend of your teaching practice in action and the quality and the engagement level of your final culminating presentation. And to showcase this, you have two options. You can either share with us hyperlinks to, to resources available on the internet, or you can share with us up images, up to 10 static images. In most cases, um, videos are generally uh, m more well received by panelists. Um, if you are a strictly visual arts focused residency, still images can be quite effective also. But if this is a performing arts based skill, workshop, um, videos are, are probably the way to go. And if you're going to go the links route, you're allowed to share with us up to three links. If you go the still images route, you can share with us 10 static images. So in my example here, I'm going to go with links. And I'll just, just I'm, I'm going to do one just to make this fast. I add a link here and use, and I can add some link, some text here to provide some context. Some notes around links. Um, if you're linking to a YouTube video, a Vimeo video, um, especially if it's particularly long, anything longer than five minutes, um, a great idea to include a, a time start and time stop here, um, where you can really point your the panelists to the specific part of your video where you want them to focus on. Um, alternately, you can, you can edit your videos before uploading so that they can simply click on the link to a video that they can see. Um, if you can avoid it, avoid the password protected links um, and uh, just, just make it an easier experience for the panelists. If you do use a password, definitely make sure you include the password information in this um, text box. Um, nothing worse than a panelist trying to see your fabulous video but can't access it because of a lack of a password. And remember, um, we're, we're soliciting applications now. Um, panelists will probably be start clicking on links in the early 2022 timeframe. So if you do use passwords and you post something up specifically for this purpose, make sure it's accessible all throughout the spring. Okay. Then we have a location question. Sure. What if the locations are in different council districts, but the host venue is the same? That's uh, perfectly fine. And, and it can actually facilitate the creation of an application proposal. It's certainly possible that social justice and non-arts organizations um, throughout the city with various branches and locations. Um, that's totally fine. And so your, your host letter, if it's from the main headquarters, you could, that same host letter can outline the various locations you're including in your proposal. So and for that, instance, the Boys and Girls Club has many locations, but their workshops would take place at the location in Council District 15. Yeah, that's one option. And then maybe your contact at that organization has pointed you to the the site director at the West Valley Boys and Girls Club, and then you have that as a backup location. That's totally fine. Okay. All right, next, next thing up on our list are our supplementary materials. This is where we're looking for a couple of key things. Um, all of our applicants under Near and Co-op are proposing sequential workshop series. So a sample lesson plan, or in the most detailed instances, a, a full-on curricula um, is important as a supplementary attachment. So make sure that one of your supplementary materials, and you have up to three of them, includes some sort of uh, lesson plan um, or curricula that corresponds to the residency you're proposing. The next two items should be great outside voices. 
that can corroborate how effective and important your programming is. So this could be a letter of support from a past workshop participant that can attest to the quality and impact of the workshop. It can be uh, other community organizations who are expressing their support for your uh, residency at that uh, at your proposed location site. Um, brochures, program materials, and newsletters are also ways of supplementing supplementing your proposed project. Those are the kinds of things we're looking for here in supplementary materials. Um, generally speaking, panelists love detailed lesson plans and curricula, so it shows that you have, you're organized and you're ready to go with a, 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 a very uh, successful project. And letters of support from past participants, in particular, can go a long way in, in convincing a, a panelist that your program has the impact that you are you are pitching. Okay, you have up to three. In my example here, I've only uploaded one. Make sure you take advantage of all three slots. Okay, home stretch, folks. Next item up is your teaching artist professional resume. No page limit here, so go to town and, and highlighting all the various uh, uh, credentials and, and, and years of working experience you've had as a teaching artist. Talk about your education background, community work, and, and your own artistic accomplishments, degrees, prior residency experience, and so forth. Um, this, this will be a teaching artist for that showcases your your qualifications. Go ahead and upload that. Mark that as complete. Um, attachment F is for collaborating artist resumes. This is optional, um, and it's okay to, that this remains gray and blank because um, it's an optional item. But if you have some like, in key guest artists who are coming in to do a demonstration to co-facilitate and co-lead uh, as part of your uh, workshop series, this is a great spot to upload their resumes also. Project budget is an important attachment here. Um, we're asking everyone, if you are a near applicant, to envision a, a series of at least 11 workshops and one culminating presentation. And we want to ask how you're going to allocate $12,000 in, in possible DCA money towards that type of work. So there's a link here to a budget form. That will be a link to a blank um, Adobe PDF template. We recommend you use Adobe Acrobat or Reader to fill it out so that the automatic calculations can work. Let's take a look at a sample here. Uh, that's provided, so you have a sense of what we're looking for. So here's an example of a near applicant who is proposing a, pro a project um, for a for a 20-week residency in this case, um, and how they are planning to utilize $12,000 in DCA money and an additional $10,490 in other sources. Okay. Um, you'll, we've outlined your budget here with some key spending categories. We expect most, if not all, of our applicants to come with us with. Number one, most importantly, artist fees. How are you paying yourself? So um, make sure you build in uh, funding for your planning efforts, for your time facilitating the actual workshops, and for any marketing evaluation or admin time you're going to put towards project success. So, and we love to see DCA funds going to paying artists, including you. So where possible, please emphasize DCA money toward paying artist fees. Uh, secondary to that, or any other guests visiting artists, project supplies and materials, marketing, evaluation, and we advise some sort of contingency, 7% of your grant to ask, um, just to be safe for those unexpected expenses. In this example here, we see that the host organization and artists are contributing some donated time towards um, planning project session, project execution, um, and $9,000 in supplies and materials donated in kind by your host organization. So the space here below, you should utilize to highlight and provide context for all the figures you're providing up top, um, highlight the donated items, what's provided and by whom. And we've also included here as a reminder, most applicants, because most applicants are going to be near applicants, make sure this column under the DCA request amounts to $12,000. Um, and uh, if you are a co-op applicant, that should be $15,000. Our ask is that you plan for that extra $3,000 as a co-op applicant to go towards the host organization to cover their administrative overhead as in partnership with you as a artist. OK, once you filled out your sample budget, you're going to go ahead and upload that, mark that complete. All right, uh, 
an, an important attachment for our co-op applicants. We wanted to see a 990 form. This is the this is the nonprofit organization tax return filed to the IRS. Um, we will need to see that so we can substantiate the reported operating budget. As as you know, we have a minimum hundred thousand dollar operating budget for co-op applicants, and can be no more than ten million dollars. I'm an individual artist, so I'm going to keep that blank and grayed out. Doesn't apply to me. And the last two items are two optional things. We look for um, a quick process evaluation form. You give us feedback on what this application process was like. Um, we, we do respond to, to feedback, and we strive to make this a process that's better year after year. So we do appreciate any feedback you can share with us. Uh, the metrics form is another optional document that outlines basic information about your organization and, and uh, the, the people you serve, your workforce, um, if, you, if you employ people. It, we, it's, we all use this information internally. It doesn't go towards uh, what the panelists see. This helps us understand uh, our, our arts ecosystem here in LA better, the more of our applicants who fill that out. Once you've hit all the necessary green check marks, and it's great to see, you get this green submit button. And before clicking on submit, we invite you to go through every single check mark, make sure you and are submitting what you had intended to upload and share. Um, once you submit this to us, you can't get it back. So um, I'm glad you're attending this workshop now because you're well ahead of the timeline and deadline. You'll have lots of op opportunity to prepare really compelling materials and to review your work, recheck and double check again. again. Um, but when you're ready to go, you click on submit and that will complete your electronic submission. What this will do is now um, mark your electronic submission complete. You'll get an automatically generated email in your inbox saying, hey, submitted your electronic application. One last step, please print out a hard copy of just the text components of your proposal and mail that to us at DCA. Uh, DCA is still working remotely, um, and UPS and FedEx have a hard time getting to our office, but UP, good old fashioned US Postal Service is reliable for us. So don't go and spend too much on the FedEx or UPS. Just use old school first class mail. Um, we're looking for a postmark deadline about just a few business days after you submit your electronic application. So just to recap, it's a November 5 online application deadline. And we want a postmark a deadline for your hard copy mailing uh, the following Wednesday, which is, oh my goodness, what is that? The Wednesday after November 5th. <laughs> Uh, just a reminder, please don't drop off your hard copy. No one will be in the office to accept it. Right. So that concludes the, the online application portion of our, our webinar. Is a good, this is a good time to pause for questions if you have them. We have a comment. It's been very helpful. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Helpful. Terrific. All right. Um, if you don't have questions now, do you know we have uh, Brenda, Raphael, and myself available to you, um, primarily by email. That's the easiest way to get a hold of us, dca.grants.licity.org. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this on the workshops page on those guidelines. So um, if you want to recap anything that we went over today, you can. it'll be available there for viewing later, um, hopefully by end of day today. Um, but with no more questions, I want to Take a moment and say thank you to all to everyone for making the time to meet with us today. This has been a pleasure. And I would